Hello everyone, uh, KV here, and welcome back to my year review for games of 2015. This is the very last one, and another on my trifecta of games that were just freaking amazing this year, and have all made games of the year, and it's pretty impressive this one, because I've only been playing it for about a week, and I have gotten nowhere near to beating it yet. That is the game, Xenoblade X. Yeah. I have with me one last time my good friend Maggie, since she was here to discuss the previous Xenoblade. We've both been playing through Xenoblade X, and we're just going to kind of share our thoughts on it. We are both nowhere near close to being in the game, so this is going to be kind of a more incomplete review. But uh, just kind of more of uh, impressions and just uh, why it does it. I mean, for me, it still feels like a very, very good game. <laughs> oh, definitely. And it's massive. Even though... I'm not near the end, I'm about the same way long as you. I still put 90 hours into it. That's so. because you're at, like, level 60 now. <laughs> 57. Okay, that was close. <laughs> so yeah, you can put a lot of time into this game. I really like they took the idea of the previous Xenoblade, which was the exploration aspect, and just kind of expanded it to everywhere. There is just literally, it's about a game that is exploration and just kind of discovery and all that great stuff. There's just... So much fun to kind of explore, learn about all the different areas, and I like that it is a bit more exploratory based because it definitely adds a lot more to the gameplay itself. It's not as linear as the first Xenoblade was, and not that I admired that too much, but it's kind of nice and refreshing that you can, like, go to places that, story-wise, you're not supposed to go to for quite a long while, but you can still get to them if you want to. Oh, yeah. It's a lot more free, I guess is a good mm -hmm. word. So, just to kind of start it off, uh, we will get into some spoilers based on what we know so far, but uh, the main story of Xenoblade is that you are humans that have the flood earth because aliens and stuff, so they really are taking back and hearkening back to the Xeno part of the Xeno series with the aliens and all that, and you crash land on some kind of planet, and you are awoken by your party members, and you need to go and figure out what the heck's with the new planet, and what's with the aliens and all that stuff. One of the new things of this game is that you yourself are a character within the story. You actually get to make your own character, and kind of determine what kind of weapons you'll use, what kind of class, and all that stuff, so you kind of determine how you level up. It does play a lot more like an MMO in, in some regards, as to like how you and your character move throughout the world. Oh yeah, it's really more like they were trying to gear towards multiplayer aspect on this game, and the character customization really kind of pulls into that. Mm -hmm. It's just the multiplayer is uh, a little odd, I guess. It took a while to figure out how to set up the multiplayer. I understand why they did the multiplayer the way they did what with the complicated story and different aspects and elements they include in the game and the giant massive world mm -hmm. it just feels a little lacking like they wanted it to be a multiplayer style game but then didn't have a lot of the same multiplayer aspects I'm kind of curious about that, if it was something that happened in development, because I remember seeing when this game was first, like, I've been interested in those games since it was first announced, when it was first called X, back when the Wii U was first being uh, showcased. I had no idea it was tied to Xenoblade. I had no idea that, well, I mean, I had no idea what Xenoblade was at that <laughs> point, to be honest. Um, but I liked the idea of it. I just liked that it was like, oh, I'm in combat. Now I'm in a mech. And I was just like, that looks fun. What's that about? And based on what I remember from that, I'm curious if there was initially going to be another main character and they ended up switching it out at some point in development to be the silent protagonist kind of character that you are to make the more multiplayer thing. So the multiplayer stuff is pretty fun, but it is, it is odd. And it does not definitely feel like it was meant to be part of the game initially. It seems like, I mean, it is integrating to the game fairly decently at the end, but... I'm not quite sure if that was, like, a main focus of the game when they were first making it, if that makes any sense. Oh, no, it it really does, because it's multiplayer, but it's multiplayer for shy people. <laughs> it's, it's like you join a, a squad room. I mean, as soon as you get past a certain point in the game, you are pretty much forced into the multiplayer aspect, unless you're playing offline. If your Wii is connected online, you have to join a squad. Uh, and the squad's full of... 32 people 
well, 31, including yourself, and you go in there, and you're in this room with these people, but they're not in the, your world at the same time. You just get nice little updates of what they're doing. They get to see updates of what you're doing, and every now and then, if you're feeling up to it, you can do little missions with them. And you can also go with well, people who are in your room. You can either spend a fee, or if you're friends with them, you can actually go and recruit them to be in your party for a little bit as well. So you can use them and uh, however you please. <laughs> and you can't level them up, but you can actually, by doing this, this helps you also with some of your own personal stuff. And it helps them as well, because that gives them the reward tickets that they can use to redeem other bits of uh, stuff that they would use to either make new outfits or just for whatever they could possibly need for other quests and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and just, like, pro tip, leveling. Go recruit yourself a level 60 and punch some bad guys in the face. It well, walk... costs a lot of money. <laughs> it does. I guess that's the way of them trying to balance it out, but that's pretty much what I did for the first 40 hours of the game was recruit level 60 people, run up to something that was level 50, punch it in the face, I will die in the first 10 seconds, and then watch the three level 60 people kill it for me, and then I get oh to reap... Three, jeez. <laughs> and then I get to reap the benefits of the reward. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of a nice thing about too is that the party that you do have is pretty free-forming. It can be you, obviously, maybe in the party at all times, but you can pick other people. You can pick people that are story-based. You can pick other people from online. You can ch take friends and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of nice to mix and match and all that good stuff. Um, in regards to that, though, just kind of the touch of the multiplayer is a little bit more. There are some missions that you can do where you actually do play in tandem with people. Like, you actually go to rooms and you actually play with people. These missions take are kind of weird to unlock, but when you do get to use do them, they are actually a lot of fun. Oh, definitely. It's like when we connected for the first time and we actually got to go out and do stuff, it was just so exciting. <laughs> we we spent more time messing around in the barracks than we did the mission. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of nice of how they did it too. It is kind of like, if they wanted to, you could see the kind of the seeds, or if they want to make this like more of an MMO type game. But I think that they are kind of conflicted because they really wanted to tell some kind of story to go with the game as well, and it just wouldn't work as well if you're having a bunch of people that you know were just a bunch of random people online that didn't have as much investment in the story. So there are some more story-based characters that you do meet along your journey that do kind of help out with things. Yeah, um, about the characters is there's more characters that you can recruit than uh, the original Xenoblade. Oh yeah, there's like there's so They many. just don't seem like they have the same charm. The first Xenoblade, it's pretty much, I absolutely loved every one of the characters. And this one, because there's so many, they didn't have time to work on personality and character traits and an in-depth growth and development period like they did for them. So... For yeah. some of them, yeah. I mean, there's there's a few that they want you to have with you the entire game, and those char few characters do go through an arc, but yeah, there's like, I don't know, like, I haven't probably met all of them yet, but I'm gonna guess like at least ten, if not more, that you can add to your party at any given point, and the reason why there are so many is kind of the unique idea as to why, is because how the structure of your class system, out of how like you do attacks and everything, they all kind of represent different uh, factions, so you can kind of get a, a insight as to how those different classes work, should you want to switch to one of those, and we can discuss that in a little bit, like the whole class system, because that's kind of a really cool bit as well, but um, yeah, some of them are definitely not super interesting, some of them are downright <laughs> obnoxious, <laughs> um, but uh, some of them are fun, so it's kind of like finding the characters that you do really enjoy, and uh, at where we're currently at in the story, it's been mainly focused on two characters, but maybe some more will get some more focus later on. I'm not quite sure, but uh, at the very least, it does feel like they it like compared to the original Xenoblade, which did feel like it was meant to feel very closed and it was meant to be like this wide open journey. This definitely feels like an even more wide open world because there are just so many different people in it. Well. There's a lot of people when you first start out. Well, not so much when you start out. It's as you go on the game, you meet more and bring more into it. And then things mm -hmm. get interesting for the characters. Because when you first start out, New LA is a little on the empty side. And it... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's and your main problem. it feels hub. a little lonely. Especially when you're in this giant, huge, vast world. Which is, I guess, why the multiplayer feature 
comes in handy then. Mm -hmm. It definitely brings that world to life a little bit more. And I think that's another thing, is that compared to the last Xenoblade, you know, which was more of a linear kind of, like, adventure story, this one's interesting in that everything plays out in a chapter or mission-like format, in which basically the format is start at base, which is New Los Angeles, the main home hub of your area, and then go to point, do something there, return. And it is kind of formulaic in that regard. From a story perspective, they make it work as to why it is like that, and it, it, it makes sense. Obviously, if you're abandoned on a new planet, you're not just going to be like, okay, bye, I'm going on an adventure, <laughs> bye, guys. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it definitely feels a lot more formulaic compared to the previous Xenoblade, and I'm not sure if that's a terrible thing at this current juncture, because we haven't... There have some, been some things that we have seen recently in the plot that are beginning to develop that's like, oh, okay, like, this might be going somewhere. We just don't know yet, and that's kind of the interesting part of not knowing, because I know in the original Xenoblade, they built up a lot of things, and this one they're trying to do the same thing, so I'm kind of curious if they will, if those will pay off as well as they did in the previous game. Well, as we are right now, uh, we're about halfway, we're exactly halfway through the game. Really? Yes, there are 12 chapters, and we're on chapter 6. We've finished chapter 6. We've finished chapter 6, so we're we're about halfway through the oh, game. That's kind of sad, actually. So, as it stands right now, the story is monolith-style story. A lot of mystery, a lot of stuff going on we don't know what's going on, and a lot of people talking terms that we don't understand yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how they sum this up. I'm I mean, the, when we finished up Chapter 6, I don't know how you felt about it, but it was very talk-heavy. Yes, so it was, yep. You really had to pay attention, and I'm wondering if the rest of the chapters are going to kind of be the same way. Very text-heavy. Possibly, because then, uh, that's, I guess that's kind of a good balance if you think about them, because a lot of the other missions are more just go out and explore, and since a lot of the, in order to get un, into those new chapters, you have to do some prerequisite things, too, so you could either do another affinity mission, which is a different thing they changed up as well. Instead of having the affinity heart-to-hearts, you now have missions that you actually do, and it gives some more character development and character growth on some of the other characters, and those are usually prerequisites to start another chapter in addition to actually going out and exploring, which means fighting more monsters and uh, mm-hmm. discovering a new area. So I guess that kind of juxtap- juxtapositions it a little bit to have it be more text-heavy in the actual story chapters because you've already done a lot of the exploration by that point. Oh yeah, it's it's by no means a problem. I actually extremely enjoy it this way because if I feel like going out and exploring, I can go out and explore. If I feel like going out and punching something in the face, I can go out and punch something in the face. And if I want to sit there and watch a cinematic scene and a cutscene, I can go ahead and do that too. So I guess, yeah, that's actually a good thing about then, too, is that if you don't want to worry about, like, you can possibly stumble into some kind of spoiler if you're mm-hmm. jumping out in the middle of the world, but unlike the previous Xenoblade, he won't, like, since it was so that game was so linear, it's not like you're going to stumble upon something that you're like, oh, no, I just want to stay here and, like, do missions for a little bit, but now I guess I'm getting sucked into this bit of the story, so that's kind of a nice thing about it as well. Yeah, it's the whole free aspect again. It's... You can, uh, when I started the game off, because I was holding off until you got the game before I progressed too far, so I just ran around and explored, and I got into pretty much every main region of the game without even going through to Chapter 4. <laughs> so, yeah, they really wanted people to just have that exploratory freedom. And, mm-hmm. and it really, really works because I am absolutely loving this game so much. Oh, yeah. Ugh. I think Oh, yeah, no, sorry, go no ahead. you can go ahead. I'm just okay. fangirling. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I think some of the freedom carries over again into that class of something I brought up earlier. So when you first start the game, you have your own character that you've made, and it starts off at like a base class. But once it gets to class level 10, that's kind of interesting how they do things. So you have basically three levels that you're always leveling up. You have your main level, which determines your strength and all that. Your class level, which determines what uh, how far along you've reached a certain aspect of class, which determines what arts you get, what kind of skills you get, and then you have another level that is for mission type stuff. So that's a separate thing, not two thing, not super huge to discuss right now, but the class level thing is interesting because once you reach a certain point, you can then start choosing other classes. This chooses what kind of weapons you'll be using and what types of arts. And I like this aspect of it too very much, because what you can do is if you master a class, you can then have access to all those arts and those weapon types whenever you want. So then if you go to start another class, like for me right now, I am, uh, 
I forget what it's called, but it's the spear wielding class. The I'm leveling that one up. Um, you know the name is off the top um, hands? It's either the Viper Striker. Something. Something. Mm. I, I don't remember. But uh, I initially went through the main like sword class, which was the Samurai Gunner and the Duelist. And since I maxed all those out, I can still use my Assault Rifle and my uh, usual sword weapon, in addition to also using the Spear-type weapon that comes with the current class I'm in, and it's... Uh, sniper rifle, which I don't like as much, but I can mix and match those different weapon types, and that also determines what arts I can use. And I think that's a really cool concept as well, because that also adds a huge level of depth to, like, arts you're leveling up. Because I remember in the first scene of Blade, basically it was, what arts do I like? I'll level these up. In this game, it doesn't work so much, at least for your main character, because since you're learning all these different arts and you have to figure out which ones go with which weapons and which ones work the best, you're like constantly strategizing as to what to actually level up. And I really like that customization about it. It's much more free compared to the free previous game. Oh, definitely. You got this whole ability to build the character the way you want it to build. Like, uh, my character right now doesn't have a single ranged attack. She's all full-blown melee. And... That's okay, you can do that in this game. Mm -hmm. And then onto that customization aspect is that they brought back the system of gear that the previous Xenoblade had in which you had different gear for like the head, the torso, the legs, and now there's also stuff for the arms, which is great because you can have dismatching <laughs> <laughs> arm plates. And that's really cool. And what's really neat about those gears is that they all bring them di something different. And from how the game works without getting too spoilerish, there's different arms manufacturers, so what? since obviously you're on this new planet and whatnot, you're not going to go and be like, bye guys, I'm off an adventure, and then you're going to run to some new business place. Oh, heck no. You're going to go stay at the main your main hub that's going to let you get more gear. But as the story progresses, you get new arms manufacturers who make different types of gear. And these different types of gear, from different, having uh, different... Uh, physical aesthetic appearances, they also do different things statistically wise, so it's kind of a good, like, another strategized thing of customization of what do I want to use and for what reason. Because also, you level up these arms manufacturers as you're progressing through the game, either by paying them a certain fee with stuff that you mine, or just by wearing their gear. So that actually can help you figure out, like, well, I really want to level up this arms manufacturer, or something like that. And of course, if you just want the outfits for the stats and you don't like the appearance, this game also has the ability to do what's called fashion gear, in which you just put on the gear that you think looks most pleasing onto the character, and that's what the character looks like, regardless of what other armor you put on them. Oh yeah, because uh, when you're trying to maximize your character, like if you want a TP and a, a high attack character, your character's going to look like a mess because of the bright red helmet and then this white suit and then these giant green pants on. I fully embrace it. Yeah, you do. <laughs> My character <laughs> has to match! She has to look good. <laughs> I mean, I keep my matching somewhat, just, you know, <laughs> different. <laughs> There's some people like that, not me, my character. I'm very OCD about how my characters look, <laughs> and having two different sleeves if they don't match the main outfit really drives me nuts. I cannot have a bright red glove on one hand and then a bright blue glove on the other while I'm wearing something that's like purple and green. Okay, you won't like the outfit I'm currently wearing then, because actually no! the actual outfit set I'm wearing, the default sleeves, they're actually different, and they're part of the same set. No! No! <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not scouting you until you change. What? No! I like <laughs> No it. reward tickets. It looks cool. You gotta change. What's cool? Just be in your skull the whole time, then. All right, well, let's get to that aspect of it. The skulls, which are the giant mechs you get to pilot. <laughs> Yay. Finally! It's taken since the PS1 era to be able to be in control of your mechs in a monolith game. I'm so happy. I was, I was just like... That was the main thing that appealed to me in this game at first. And when I finally got to play Xenoblade and I got to see, like... I mean... Spoilers now! We'll get into spoilers about Xenoblade X, but spoilers towards 
actual Xenoblade, the first one, there are people piloting those giant things like Metal Face, and I was like, I'd like to pilot that thing. That looks cool. Can I pilot it? Nah, I can't pilot. Oh, dang. <gasps> but I can pilot something in this game, and the customization comes to back in full swing once again with the ability to change up all your different weapon gear, and even paint it however you want it so you can make it look as awesome as you want to look, or as silly. It depends. Whatever you want to do. You can do. even name it. I know. I have a current scale is called the KV Blitzel because that just sounded cool. So that's what it's called. I called mine my little princess because that's what it is. It's my princess. <laughs> um, that also does change the combat a lot more. So what's really cool is that in the previous Xenoblade, they had like these giant monsters that were meant to be boss monsters. In this game, they have those back, but they're intended to be fought with the scales because, you know, you have now a giant max and now you can take on the giant monster and they do go down a lot easier if you're using them. That's a fun aspect of it. It's fun to go into combat with these things. It's fun to just use them to just hover around. I think we get the ability to fly later with them. And we can also turn them into a car and just be like <laughs> zooming around. It's just, oh, it's just so much fun. Uh, of course, don't get them blown up because that's bad. Oh, yeah. They actually bounced them out so it wasn't too OP. So, they do have their own HP bars. If that HP bar reaches zero, they blow up, and you have to pay a, a very significant fee to get them repaired. Mm -hmm. So, don't let your insurance lapse. <laughs> Life lessons. Yes. Um, going back on to like more exploration things, what's really cool is that you do get to go around, there's the landmarks, there's the whole quick travel system again and with the landmarks, but this time you also get to install what are called data probes, and that allows you to expand more of the map so you can see more of it, and also allows you to have better points to travel to, and of course, like the last game, every time you discover a new area, or every time you put down one of these probes, you get experience for it. So it's a game that really does reward exploration a lot. And what's really nice about that too is that the highly quests in this game, well, there's still quests you can get by just like walking around and talking to people, there's usually a quest board that usually has more of the like, gather X, kill X. And what's cool about these is that if you might just select them by happenstance and you have all the items, it's just like, boom, you did the quest. Congratulations. More quests opened up for you. Oh, it's so much... Very convenient. So much better. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I'm trying to think. Anything else? Cause I want to talk like a little bit as far as story bit, but before we get into that, anything else you can think of as far as like gameplay-wise right now? We've discussed a lot about it, and it's super fun, but just trying to think of anything else to discuss about it. A game is mostly gameplay based. It's mm -hmm. its strongest feature down to the combat, to the exploration, to the customization. I guess maybe music. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, first, before we discuss music, though, I want to say pretty much everyone in the game looks freaking gorgeous. Oh. Just wanted to just bring that out because holy crud, this game visually is just like, wow. I mean. The previous Xenoblade, obviously being a Wii game, couldn't do the what it wanted to do as far as some of the visuals, but it tried to make it work, but this game just goes, nope, we're just, boom, everything is just popping, and just, oh, it's just vivid, and I just love everything about it. Yeah, I've wasted so much time trying to take scenery shots. <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, music, we'll touch on that really briefly. Music is in, um interesting in this game. I guess it's probably the best word to use for it. <laughs> Most of the music is pretty decent. A lot of the like, area themes are pretty okay. I mean, the first area theme you go to, Primordia, is kind of whatever, but once you get to areas like Oblivia or Noctilum or Sylvadum, you just go like, holy crap, Like the music here is just oh, I, c I can feel like Xenoblade, the first one, re-resonating here. And then you have the battle theme, which is... Um, Odd. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly something that I've come to expect from Monolith, and it's not something that I'm usually too keen on. It's 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 rap. Yeah. It's it's this like super technical thing, and then all of a sudden it's just someone starts rapping about you know being a distant planet and all that stuff. And I mean, it makes a little sense. You characters are technically from the U.S. and all that, but I'm just kind of like it's just kind of is odd, does not seem to go with some of the rest of the game, and I mean, to be fair, I did not really find the main battle theme of the previous Xenoblade to be that interesting either, so, so getting that out of the water, like, it's not like I'm, like, I was expecting, like, the most amazing thing from a main battle theme, but it was just kind of, it was just weird, but other battle themes, like, the battle themes against some of the alien aggressors, mm -hmm. or 
fighting the tyrants, which are basically the boss monsters, those are fun tracks, and those use some of the similar ideas of having, like, vocals and whatnot, but they use them in a much more interesting way other than, you know, rapping. Well, as you were explaining it to me before, which I 100% agreed to, is they geared the song to make more sense to the area and the characters. Like you said, mm -hmm. they're from New L.A., so of course they're going to kind of have that urban-sounding music to go with them. Mm-hmm. And I guess that that works then because all the other areas feel much more alien and much more unique, and that kind of that really works together. So it's a very eclectic soundtrack in a in a in a sense. Uh, Xenoblade on the Wii felt more it felt more whole. This one feels more kind of all over the place, but it's a good all over the place because it kind of makes sense for the world it has, and it's definitely not a bad soundtrack. Just has some interesting choices in places here and there. Just a difference in personal taste. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's bad, it's perfectly yeah. fine. I still love the Tyrant Battle theme, it's just... Yes. Oh, and the Scale Battle theme is pretty fun, too. So, just to end this off, let's talk about... I know the spoiler thing's been up for a while anyway, since we've discussed spoilers from the previous <laughs> Blade, but spoilers on this current story of what we've gotten so far. So we both be in Chapter 6, and what's been revealed so far is uh, interesting. So you, as your character... You did not uh, come with that, like, huge crash of the New Los Angeles area. You were something else that another character, Elma, found, and you end up joining this group of people who go around scouring the planet, trying to figure out the whole mystery of what happened to the main thing on your ship, the giant air sh giant spaceship, the White Whale, which is called the Life Hold. The Life Hold holds, apparently, the rest of humanity in stasis, just like you were in stasis, and if uh, it falls into the wrong hands... Humanity may not be able to survive. I mean, we have humans in New L.A. right now, so, I mean, it's not a huge deal if we don't find the life hold, right? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Until the very interesting, though sometimes oddly revealed, reveal of... Just kidding, we're all robots. Yeah, it kind of came out of nowhere. It did, it was... Yeah, I mean... I mean, I'll give it this, I'll give it credit to this, um, to juxtapose it against something else in the last game, Xenoblade, you know what they built up a lot that was like, just get on with it already? The idea that Mumcar was Metal Face. It took them forever to figure that out, and I was just like, you, you, you know who that is, shut up, figure it out. <laughs> so, I guess... To counteract that, we do have a more what-the-hell moment in this with the whole we're-all-robots thing that just kind of comes out of nowhere. I mean, it makes sense as to why they explain it as when they do, but I guess I'll kind of pass that it came out of nowhere thing because I do have the whole, well, you kind of should have figured out Mumcar was in that back the whole time <laughs> in the previous game. Yeah, again, since we haven't completed the story yet, we have no idea what other stuff is going to happen, so this might actually make a ton more sense later. Mm -hmm. At least actually did make more sense as to why I find this life hold thing is so important, is that in actuality, everyone in New uh, Los Angeles is a robot. What in the life hold is actually the real human bodies of everybody who have all been put into stasis. The reason being is that, hey, we are going into space. We had no idea how long we'd be in space for. It made sense to put everyone in an extended hypersleep and just have our consciousness operate bodies that looked like humans so that we could still function a ship because, you know, it could take us anywhere from 10 to 100 years to find a new planet to inhabit. So, of course we're robots. It, like, it actually made sense as to why that was the case. It's just kind of more of the execution later of people just, you know, randomly talking about it. Yeah, when it was, that was the word. Yeah, when it, especially since they, the biggest excuse was the less people who know and just think they're a real person, the better. And then as soon as you find out, everybody's just like, yeah, we're robots. What of it? Yeah, mo most people anyways, yeah. So you also meet some new alien races that are really interesting, and you kind of get a bigger picture as to what's going on as to what we're at right now. We understand is that basically... The main alien force that destroyed Earth, as far as we know, is called the Prone. But they are just pawns of another giant alien force called the Ganglion, who's basically trying to take over the universe. For what reason is not super clear at this current juncture for us, but the reason given based on some cutscenes that we do get to see of them is that they're stuck. They're not they're stuck in some kind of they call it a phenomenon. 
to which they actually explain, like, hey, isn't it kind of convenient that everyone happens to speak the same language as we do? Crash on the same planet as everyone? So there's something drawing everyone to this planet, the planet called Mira, and the mystery of that is what's exciting. That's what I'm kind of excited to see. It might not have the biggest payoff compared to the previous Xenoblade you know, with the whole, oh yeah, ever, there's these two titans are giant gods that like came from some other place, but uh, it it seems like it will have something interesting going for it, and I think, at least for me, I know for some people, and if you've played through the whole game, please don't spoil it for us, we'd like to find out on our own, but um, for us, we're kind of interested to see if there is, I know they said this is the spiritual successor to Xenoblade, not a direct sequel, but if there might be some kind of hint as to this might be something to do with the universe that Shulk made in the, Z- in the first Xenoblade or something like that. Something that would be interesting to kind of tie the two games together because we do have the note pawn and everything, so maybe there's something going on, or maybe it's just coincidence. And, you know, either's fine with me, but it'd be kind of cool to see something. No, I guess we're just going to have to play more and find out. I know, so we should probably get on that instead of talking about it because we've been talking for about nearly 30 minutes now just because I knew we were... <laughs> it's just... Oh my gosh, this game. And of course, now I gotta go record some B-roll for it too, so it's gonna be a fun time out of yes. for me. <laughs> but, um, so, thank you everyone for watching all these year interview videos. I'm not sure if this will be up on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, but I hope you have a happy new year, and uh, look forward to more great games coming in 2016, and I will see you again sometime later, and uh, hopefully for more of you year interview for next year as well. Thank you, of course, Maggie, for being here for discussing this game as well. Oh, no problem. I was delighted. Oh, yeah. And this is definitely, yeah, so my trifecta of, like, three games that came out this year that are must-haves. Splatoon, Triforce Heroes, and Xenoblade X. Fantastic games, and just, just go play them and have fun. So have a good holiday, everybody, and a good new year. I will see you all on the next one. Until then, KV out.